just for a minute, take off the table the words good, this is bad, shame, guilt, that's not ethical. Take all that off the table and be a little selfish for a minute. It's like aiming at this thing and doing this behavior is going to train your body, whether it's pornography or something like methamphetamine, that's going to be what you are going to obsess over because that's where you're going to chase that positive emotion. Well, hello there and welcome. You are listening to the In Session Podcast and I'm your host, Lisa Wilson. It's my privilege to be on this journey of self-discovery with you. I truly believe that living a life by design is possible and that's exactly what we're here to talk about. So let's jump right in. Boy, do I have a special episode for you guys today. And I have two amazing guests that are joining me on the podcast. Up first, we have Dave McDonald. I met Dave whenever we were working together on the set of The Resident earlier this year. And um, then we found ourselves in Kentucky working on two different projects, actually. But we were staying at the same hotel and we bumped into each other at the elevators. And the next thing you know, we were at dinner having conversations that were extremely enlightening, then went into the path of, of where we're taking this podcast today, which is on the subject of dopamine. So Dave is obviously an actor. He started his career as a military broadcast journalist for the U.S. Army. He hosted a radio and talk show in Berlin on the American Forces Network for three years. After leaving the service, he headed for Los Angeles, California, and graduated from the theater department at Loyola Marymount University. Dave toured nationally with the Chicago-based Griffin Theater production, Letters Home, and started his TV career in the Windy City. After moving to Asheville, North Carolina, he started working in film and TV projects based in the Southeast. Some of his notable credits are Ozark, Stranger Things, The Resident, and Mr. Mercedes. And my other distinguished guest is Jonathan J. Esslinger. Jonathan is a licensed clinical mental health counselor and licensed clinical addictions specialist. His clinical experience began at the Emory University Hospital's Wesley Woods Day Treatment Program for geriatric patients, and then progressed through to the other end of the spectrum as a child specialist, conducting trainings through the North Carolina Division of Child Development and Early Education. After moving to North Carolina, Jonathan served as the program director at Meridian Behavioral Health Services Recovery Education Center from 2006 to 2012. During that time, he was immersed in the recovery model, which strongly influenced his counseling techniques, giving him a wide range of expertise to help his patients. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my two very distinguished guests today, Dave and Jonathan. Welcome to the show. Hi. Glad to be here. Hi. Yeah, very good to be here. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited for this conversation because it's a little bit different than uh, the conversations I've been having on the show up to this point. These guys have a range of expertise from their different life experience, and I just felt like it was such a, a valuable topic to to bring to this audience. So um, first up, I, I, I want to talk, Dave, a little bit about your time in the monastery. So one of the things about um, about this conversation is is removing yourself from any distractions so you can start like training your dopamine receptors to fire off after um, things that are a little bit more intentional. And so Dave has spent time in a monastery. Um, do you mind speaking a little bit to what your experience was like there and kind of that removal of all the outside noise to get you more focused and in a place where you have more control over your life? Yeah. You know, I uh, was in Los Angeles uh, going to Loyola Marymount, which is a Catholic university. And we had a, you know, religion class and there was, they are, we're talking a lot about the saints. And of course, even Jesus himself went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. There was always this kind of like talk of sensory deprivation. And I made the comment to the professor, like, why don't we all do that? Like, why isn't that part of our, why isn't that a class or, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the professor looked at me and was like, well, why don't you do that, Mr. McDonald? Mm. And so it kind of set me off on this um, journey or adventure. And I, I thought, you know, well, let's see what happens when you do do that. And of course, I was in um, uh, Los Angeles or, you know, it, at this point, Venice Beach when I was going to Loyola. And so there was a lot going on there. And um, I would go at first to this monastery in the high desert. And so I would drive out there and then I would hang out with these Benedictine monks and they had this incredible like theater uh, that was, you know, not really in use anymore, but it was in the desert. So it was like a, what do you call it? A, you know, the seats are like a stadium seating, but made oh, out yeah, of rock. Yeah. And, yeah. Just like, so, you know, as like an acting student, I'm sitting out there in this 
desert and, you know, the sun's going down and it, it was just, you know, I had the sense of peace. Um, I was not overstimulated. Um, I was able to sleep really soundly mm. and then I would, you know, spend several days there and then I would drive back into Los Angeles and I would immediately go, what is happening? And then as I would get into Venice, I'd be looking at the way things were kind of built and the way they had organized the city. And you start wondering, is this like madness? Like, is how could there be such a difference between this kind of simplicity and beauty and the way that I felt to how and now I feel driving back into to where I'm living? And so that just sparked this kind of constant search for this feeling of just being uh, at peace and, you know, content. And I think it is linked. It's funny, you know, we talk about dopamine. It's like, so you can have a religious conversation, but you're, we talk about this at dinner, but what you're really talking about are individuals that are trying, I think, to attach that positive feeling to something good for them mm, yeah. and trying to place themselves in environments where they're going to be more successful because, you know, part of it is admitting that maybe you're just not strong enough to be, uh, to resist some of the temptations or maybe you just get distracted too easily. And so there's a certain humility that comes with removing yourself and putting yourself in a simple environment. Um, of course, when you do that, and this is where I think, you know, in my tradition, the great saints and even Christ himself, like when you hear the story of the transformation that happens when individuals actually do do that, when they remove themselves and put themselves in an environment where they can maybe just focus on the things that are good for them. Right. There's this transformation that happens. Right. And I, and then, so to bring it back to the dopamine, uh, it's like, you know, the, the modern science is telling us that when you do that, you're creating these, you know, these pathways to dopamine and you become kind of attracted to uh, accessing them. But the way that you're accessing them is good for you. Mm, right. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, because you've attached it to like positive behavior. And of course, you can do the opposite of that. And so, for me, I was seeing, I was feeling that like it was, I was like my body and my mind was a laboratory mm -hmm. and uh, I would go from like, you know, the heart of Venice beach, California to a monastery. And then <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden I would have a very different experience and I would, I would think about different things and I would feel better and I would look better, Yeah, you know? And, um, yeah. And so I, then, then our, our, you know, our conversation at dinner after hearing some more recent studies and videos that came out on this whole dopamine thing, you begin to realize, wow, you know, this is, uh, this is grounded in science. Right. You know, um, so that, that's kind of the whole monastery thing. And, um, it was, it was me just trying to s seek a, an environment, um, you know, where I could focus on specific things without being distracted. And it kind of opened up a whole bunch of other things. And I ultimately uh, decided that, I was going to kind of stay on the front lines and try to work it out, you know, living a normal life, mm -hmm. you know, which is a vocation in its own right. So sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I love how that conversation took us to this YouTube video that you shared with me, um, uh, Andrew Huberman video that he had interviewed Jordan Peterson about. Um, it's pretty much an argument for monogamy as far as yeah. the scientific aspect of this goes. And yeah. that was the thing that was really great for me in that conversation because so much of my life there has been a shame element attached to like you shouldn't do this or there's no you can't do that it's like yeah. these parameters that were given without a real understanding other than shame of why you shouldn't do them you know and yeah. so what you shared with me and what I learned from watching these videos and and what I'm I'm excited to hear Jonathan's perspective about is the actual scientific process of what what happens in the body and in the brain whenever you start sending your energy, sending your habits and your thoughts towards like particular things. And we spread our, our, our focus out so much that we're, um, we're stimulated by so many things. So we have all these different dopamine hits. I'm, I, you know, I'm curious what it would look like in a world where someone gets really focused and really disciplined about where they're allowing their dopamine hits to come from.
Jonathan, what's your thought on this from the experience you've had working with with your clients or just your knowledge base when it comes to creating a life that is more focused and disciplined as far as like where you allow your your dopamine to be stimulated at? Yeah, right. I mean, that's really the heart of the question because the dopamine is really a result of what you're aiming for or what's important for you. Um, and like you said, or like Dave kind of implied at the end there, that it could be it could be the opposite of something good. Um, right. And the way it works kind of chemically to kind of highlight this out is it's really what you do or are doing right before you get the dopamine is what you learn to want to do again in order to get that dopamine. Mm. So um, it gets funky because like chocolate gives you like 1.5 times your regular dopamine. And like cigarettes are like two or two and a half or cocaine, I think is two and a half. Amphetamines are like 10 times or something. Gosh. So... The problem is if you're not doing, usually if you're like, you're just not really doing anything good usually. Like you're just, you don't have to do anything. You're just buying drugs. So then what happens is the act of buying the drug or the act of buying the chocolate becomes what you crave, Mm -hmm. which is why we'll think about like, oh, I could go to the store and I could get this item, you know, Mm. so this happens with food or anything. Yeah. Any level of shopaholism. (laughs) Yeah. But the chemical thing that sucks is the body always wants to be in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So when you give it the dopamine, what it then has to give you is the pain Mm. or the suffering. And so what you do then is you just get more dopamine. Mm -hmm. But then what happens is the weights hit the other side. Right. And what the person discovers, like if you're using chocolate to get that dopamine, that you have to have a little more chocolate each time. And then after a while, what the brain says is, screw it. I'm not going to give you any dopamine for this. And you only get the sadness. And so that, that that's kind of maybe a, a brief kind of talk about some of the points I think that as far as the science about how it interplays with your behaviors, what you're doing at the time and how it's a process that, you know, hedonism has no end and except sadness and darkness. Right. Right. Yeah. And it, it sounds like there's a lot of passive behaviors that start taking place because it's habit forming. Therefore it's just kind of like a autopilot situation. Is that something that you've seen in people? Yeah, I I think probably the best representation where it shows up is about 10 years ago, there's this, when I I was in public mental health, and we just had tons of people coming in the door, and you had to do all these clinical assessments. And I kept diagnosing people with something called dysthymia. Okay. Dysthymia is, it's like someone who has depression, but they're more like Charlie Brown depressed. Okay. You know, like they get out of bed. And they go to the baseball game, but they don't have any fun. Nothing's mm, enjoyable. Right. Um, everything is like good grief kind of stuff. <laughs> going through the motions just to get yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. And it's called dysthymia. It's when the majority of your days, for the majority of the day, you're just meeting a lot of criteria for depression, lack of energy, thinking about death maybe. But you don't really meet criteria because normally people are depressed. It happens for a couple of weeks or a month. But you come out of it. Right. And then um, once I discovered what masturbation was doing to men, I discovered that all the people I was diagnosing with dysthymia were just men who were masturbating to pornography all the time. Mm, Interesting. And it creates, um, and so there's all these studies like in married couples where the man is masturbating to pornography, it ends up where both he and his partner are less happy Mm -hmm. for individuals who are masturbating to a lot of video pornography. What they're getting is the dopamine and then the fall off. Mm -hmm. But the reason this is so important is normally when you're making love 
to your lover, you're getting dopamine plus oxytocin, which is like a love bonding chemical. Right. But when you are doing it to video pornography, your br- a male brain doesn't know it's not really happening. Mm. So, yeah. So when so from the brain's perspective, you've actually had sex with that woman, but there was no oxytocin, just dopamine. Wow. So this goes to the idea of be careful where you get your dopamine from because it might not be good for you. Sure. So how do we make that sexy? Because that's the the question of, you know, it's, it's like, I think there's this whole, um, in the world we're in now, it's like, it's kind of like Woodstock in the 70s. It's like free love. Everybody's having sex with everybody. Dating is a free for all. It's just the wild, wild west out there. And so everybody's dopamine receptors are off. So how would you take someone that's in the, in the thick of this and, and explain to them the negative impact that they're having on their life and how they can correct it? Or like, what does the rock bottom look like? Is there always a rock bottom or can people just exist in this space forever? Can I, let me, I'm going to have yeah, jump in. one comment on this. I think, see, this is the interesting tie to me with religion, which I know is not like a really politically correct thing to talk about anymore. And I get it. <laughs> I, I, but like, When put in this context, it becomes really interesting Mm -hmm. because just like an athlete that has a plan when he goes to the gym Mm -hmm. and like there's really focused on their macros and what, what, you know, uh, exercises they're going to do. And they have a real structure to what they're aiming at. They have goals. They have maybe body weight goals or whatever. Um, They have a lot of success. Right. Because they're, they're walking into a, um, a structure that is helping them maintain focus and aim. And my revelation with this was like, well, obviously that's what our ancestors are attempting with religion. Right. To some degree. And and they probably learned early on that if you focused on um, adultery or some other thing, you were going to all of a sudden obsess about that thing. And you're not going to be paying attention to developing and cultivating the relationship with your wife. Right. Because there's no dopamine there. Sure. Be- because you've attached it to something else. And that would be the modern day pornography. Right. Right. And so this, and I'm just, you know, it's fascinating because we were talking about how you can take the whole guilt and the the moral and the ethics and the shame, like put that, get it off the table. Like mm-hmm. just talk about what you're really doing biologically. Right. And whether that's serving you in any way. Right. Yeah, because it's almost like if you ask somebody, would you like to eat this fresh organic apple that was raised with no chemicals, no hormones, no nothing? It's it's perfect and it's from Earth and it's amazing. Or would you like this apple that's been laced with cyanide? Because yeah. they're going to have very different impacts on the body. And so that's basically the difference. It's like, do you want to give yourself something that's going to create life or do you want to give yourself something that's going to create death? And maybe, Lisa, I'd add to that, maybe it's more like you can have this apple that's really good and healthy, or you can have this other apple that's coated in caramel. Mm-hmm. It's perfectly ripe. It's got extra sugars added into it. Right. And it's and we've made it crisp through some modifications, so you're really going to like this. So here, here's, here's another cool analogy. Or here's the other one. How about you plant, how about, how about you learn how to plant the apple tree and you cultivate the apple tree and you learn how to grow fruit, and then you pick the fruit and you eat the fruit. Mm-hmm. It's like as opposed to somebody handing you a caramel apple and being like, "Here's a caramel apple." Right. And I think that's that becomes the I think what we're talking about when it comes to because when you when you pick a simple dopamine pathway, you it robs you of the motivation to journey toward that thing, mm-hmm. right? The the motivation to get to that thing that creates that positive emotion Yes. that, so all of a sudden you're not motivated to, to work out things with your partner or to g- be romantic mm-hmm. or to cultivate that relationship because that's not where your positive emotion is not lying at the end of that journey anymore. Right. right. And I think like, it's so clear to me. And, and um, so I think, I think our ancestors were attempting this or are still attempting this through 
religion, using it as a as a as a GPS system to try to stay focused on things so that you're chasing positive emotion and dopamine through pathways that are serving you. Right. And of course, it's more complicated than that. And there's lots of debate, but I, I, it just seems to me that, that they figured out like, oh, okay, like something like the 10 commandments. Like mm-hmm. I never under, like, somebody comes down with a bunch of rules. Mm-hmm. Well, what, 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 you know, now you understand like, oh, maybe those rules were because people were really unhappy because mm. they weren't following certain, you know, things. Well, but, you're, you're, you're not wrong. The science wouldn't agree with your statement that there's a debate about this. Yeah, it's yeah. It, the connection's really clear on dopamine. You can get it in two ways. One way you can get it is have a unique experience, just something new. Anything new releases dopamine and it sort of lubricates the system to pay attention. Mm. But the real way we get dopamine is when we see that what we're aiming at we see that we're getting closer to achieving what we're aiming at. Sure. But this means that you want to choose something you can aim at that isn't Mm self-destructive. And in many ways, the case can be made that, you know, religion or these wisdoms that get passed down are an attempt to try to figure out what's the best way to live, so to speak. Right. Um, and, And then so you end up with some potential answers there, you know, that, Mm -hmm. uh, that because the dopamine is released actually technically when you are thinking about the story or what's happening and Mm -hmm. you see resolved what you hoped would happen. Mm -hmm. So like we hoped to have a good conversation here. And once we feel that's happening, we'll get a dopamine release. Right. But if this starts going South real quick, we'll (laughs) lose that dopamine. (laughs) So watch it. Yeah, I got it. I'm on my P's and Q's. Um, <laughs> um, I, I like both of the analogies you guys gave with the apple tree and the candy coated apple, because I think to Dave's point, it's like there is that long term investment in seeing something pay off. It's like with our careers as actors, we know that we're in the long game. And for us, the payoff comes down the road. So we have trained our dopamine receptors to focus on the long game. And the candied apple scenario is the quick hit. Mm -hmm. It's that quick, really attractive, like it's the fast car. And and the the apple tree is the Hyundai, you know? And so that's what makes it appealing. So I guess that the, the conversation then becomes, how do we make people understand what's happening in their um, neural receptors whenever they choose the fast car over the Hyundai. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be curious to hear, you know, I think Dave has probably some stuff to share on how, you know, maybe spirituality or religion can offer some of that, because I do think that there's answers there that you'll hear people who are like addicted to substances will often find religion as a pathway out. So there's right. something there. Right. Um, but I will add before that, that um, what I tend to, wh- where I've sort of landed as I work with people with addiction is this idea that ultimately what they're going to have to do is choose to suffer. It's like, you want that better apple with the caramel on it. Mm-hmm. Duh. Mm-hmm. But what you're going to actually do is suffer. Right. You want to look at all those videos, but what you're actually going to do is suffer. You right. want to buy that pack of smokes, but what you're going to do is suffer Mm -hmm. by not doing these things that would, you want the chocolate, but don't. So you have to kind of convince people to voluntarily not get what they want. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there's the answer there that I'll kind of pass over to Dave. It's like, so maybe be careful about what you're wanting. Right. And then how do, and, and I think that, I think that's something religion can provide a lot of, which is some advice on what to possibly want. Yeah. I don't know. Is that a fair right. statement? Yeah. And I, you know, and I'm not, I am sensitive to like talking about religion is, you know, um, is hard, you know, right. because I, I, you know, I, but I, when, when you see it in this context of what we're talking about and I'm in a relationship now and I'm deploying a lot of these things and it's helping a lot, mm-hmm. you know, this kind of like focusing on finding positive emotion with my partner and, you know, uh, in, in a whole variety of ways. And it's like, it's just been amazing. But then the parallels of, of talking to monks and people that are on this kind of intense 
spiritual quest, you know, you realize that's what they're doing, you right. know, and they struggle too in the monastery for sure. So you just, I, I think it's a matter of understanding that, and we, we, we talked about this Lisa at dinner again, and I'll say it, it's not just for a minute, take off the table, the words, good, this is bad, right. shame, guilt, that's not ethical. Mm -hmm. Take all that off the table and be a little selfish for a minute. It's like aiming at this thing and doing this behavior is going to train your body, whether it's pornography or something like methamphetamine, that's going to be what you are going to obsess over. Right. Because that's where you're going to chase that positive emotion. That's going to really happen. And that's not debatable. So you're now going to be a slave to the things that you choose to aim at because they're going to put in this whole this whole pattern of behavior for you to attain those things. Yes. And and, and in a relationship, if you're not, if you don't look at your partner and go, oh God, it's really important that we attach positive emotion to each other. You know, something mm -hmm. as simple, and Jonathan and I have talked about this. When somebody leaves in the morning or they come home in the evening, those transition times have got to be really conscious and they should be they should be mostly positive mm -hmm. the most of the time because they're going to happen a lot in a, in a long-term relationship yes and if if you can both consciously say we're going to aim at making these beautiful moments like a kiss goodbye in the morning i love you be safe i can't wait to see you in the evening that builds that positive emotion and then it puts in play um this pattern of behavior Right. That the pe people will adopt it because the body and the mind wants that dopamine and that positive behavior. And so you're basically saying, okay, I see how I work. This is how my body works. And so I'm going to now hack my system and make really sure that I'm aiming at the things I want and that I want to be healthy and beautiful. And, and then I'm going to, um, I'm going to develop those patterns. Mm -hmm. And of course it is parallel to religion. Sure. That's why there's a, a structure in a mass. That's why there's uh, monasteries. There's, you know, I think it's our ancestors. And of course, this also transcends all the other traditions. They're attempting to aim at the correct thing. And now sometimes individuals fail within those traditions and they use those, that structure for bad things. And so that's obviously, you know, uh, an individual's, you know, choice. Right. Um, but having the structure seems to me necessary or at least really helpful when it comes to keeping focused on the things that serve you. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I've thought about as you guys have been talking is the pain threshold that is involved whenever people start changing their habits and they're saying no to certain things that give them the dopamine hit. There's like actual physical pain when like a withdrawal that people experience whenever they're saying no to certain substances, for example, um, whenever they've, they're used to consuming them, like an alcoholic, you know, they'll go into withdrawals or even sugar. Sugar has this horribly addictive aspect about it that I, I've been taking sugar out of my diet trying to get it completely out and I'm feeling myself wanting something yeah. sweet even if I like go for an apple it's like something to, yeah. for this sweetness so there's a pain threshold that we're dealing with and and that requires some discipline to get past um, Jonathan I would I would love to hear your thoughts on how you handle that particular aspect of things with your your patients yeah there's sort of two processes there and one of them will hit kind of first because it's related to dopamine. And what's weird about dopamine is dopamine is actually converted into an energy source to pump you up. Okay. So you need the energy to uh, have the energy to even move forward. And in many ways, that's what sometimes feels painful. It's that when you're not getting what you want, you don't have the energy to even move forward with anything. Right. Because it, your body needs the dopamine to convert into, and I can't remember the chemical since I'm a counselor, not a, not an endocrinologist. But, <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. We can uh, look it up it's later. the energy one, the one that pumps you up. Okay. It's, uh, it's endorphins. That's endorphins. What it is. It's dopamine converts into endorphins. That's Got it. it. 
So, so you need the dopamine. So without endorphins, you're like dead in the water, really. Right. Um, so that's part of the pain. But then there are, it's partly the craving that you're not getting that feels painful, right? Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. like, because you want this thing and you're not having it. But then with certain drugs, there is actually a physiological withdraw or you get symptoms as the drug pulls out of you. Right. Um, so I, I, it would be those two things. Did that kind of answer the question? I might not have. Um, well, the science of it, but the question really is how how does one face off with those particular pain points as they're changing their behavior patterns. Because if, if the end of the day, like I have to believe that people in general want to be healthy. I think there's certain certain wounding that we have that causes certain behavior patterns as coping mechanisms. So a lot of times we'll use alcohol as the example. People will use alcohol when they're happy, when they're sad. And it's, it's like, whatever, it's a medication to either cover up or celebrate. But typically, if it's being used as something that is is a way to cope, they're masking feelings from something else. So they're they're having to go deep and and like deal with other issues or face off with other issues, other demons, so to speak. So the question then is, how does one face off with these pain points and stay diligent in the pursuit of creating a better life by changing these habits and and moving your dopamine receptors towards something that's a healthier choice? Where's the benefit? Where's the reward? And is there a reward system, you know, that can be put in place? Like my curiosity is, is like, I'm a, I'm a white knuckle kind of person. I can white knuckle anything, but I know the vast majority of people are not like that. So for me to take sugar on my diet, I just look at it and I sit in the craving and I'm like, oh, I want to punch a wall right now. And I'm not going to have that candy bar. I'm not going to do it because I made a commitment to myself, but that's not normal, you know? So (laughs) for the people that can't white knuckle it, there has to be some way that they can face off that battle because it's a battle. You're at war with yourself. And in order to change your dopamine hits, your dopamine receptors going towards something that's more positive and more healthy, you've got to give it some sort reward system, right? I would think. Yeah. Um, well, we're sort of left, there's weirdly only kind of five things you can do to manage an uncomfortable emotion. Okay. Um, and four of the five don't really work. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one. Yeah, <laughs> Let's talk right. about that one. Well, all right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll do the first four because this word is real quick. You can distract yourself from it. Okay. Right? You can opt out completely. That's like go to sleep, right? Mm-hmm. Do a bunch of heroin well, or something. I've done that. I've gone yeah, to right? sleep. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. Sleep you distract, work. opt out. You can change how you think about it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, or you can change your bodily sensation, and that would be more like the alcohol or going for a big run, right? right. Um, or punch a punching bag. So right. it's not that those don't work. They do, but they actually don't fix the original problem. Although sometimes if you're just trying to get off of chocolate or something, or alcohol, it might be able to distract yourself enough to get to that point where you're no longer as physiologically connected. But so those are the four things the brain does repetitively. There's one other thing you can do, which is approach the problem, make it worse. Um, And that turns out to be the best sort of strategy, really, for dealing with the white knuckling approach. It's like, If someone's having a panic attack, one of the best treatments, normally what someone does is they say, they try to tell themselves, I'm fine. I just need to breathe. I need to calm down. And that's what they're trying to do. And of course, it doesn't work and gets progressively worse. What you actually do is make it worse. Like, I feel like my heart's going to explode. Let me see if I can make it explode. Oh, interesting. I feel like I can hardly breathe. Let me see if I can make that worse. Wow. And what you'll discover is you can't. Okay. So it's a, it's a famous concept by Carl Jung, and it sounds very Buddhist, but it's just 1950s or 60s. Yeah. Carl Jung, he said, what you resist persists. Yes. Yes. So right. you're saying be in flow with it, essentially. Allow it to flow through you and sit, yes. sit in the ickiness of it and just yes. allow it to, to be what it is. Face because, the suffering. Yeah, face the suffering because there's so much information in there telling you about what's going on in your body. And, and it'll actually, the only way to tolerate it, if you try to distract or avoid, it'll just creep up. Yeah. And it'll, so it'll knock it, you down. 
And right. I think, you know, when you look at, you hear from a Buddhist perspective that life is suffering. Right. Right. And they don't, they, they mean that. Yes. Um, that's true. Right. And so uh, in the Christian perspective would be pick up your cross and, and bear it. Now, that, there's a lot of genius in both of those statements, because when you're talking about dopamine is, you know, you're looking for positive emotion, meaning you're going to have to confront the fact that that life can, you know, that suffering exists. Right. And what Jonathan's saying, picking up your cross or moving into that suffering seems to be the only way that you can come out the other end of it. But then again, by engaging in that journey... Uh, it seems to create positive emotion in the sense that you develop, you, you become a better version of yourself mm -hmm. and that creates a sense of accomplishment, a sense of victory. Um, it also isn't denying the fact that life is really hard, right? You've picked it up and you're carrying the cross. And these are of course metaphors I never understood for the majority of my life. Right. Um, thought some of them were rather silly. <laughs> and now as I've gotten older and gotten my ass kicked by life more. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> they, I, 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 oh, and then we talk about dopamine. You're like, oh, you mean I'll feel better when I just accept the fact that I'm in a shitty situation mm -hmm. and now I need to make it work. Mm -hmm. And I need to start. I, here's the other thing I wanted to say. Okay. So life is suffering. Okay, so now as actors, we have incredible imaginations. Right. So now you have to get to work. <laughs> okay, so life is suffering. So I'm now going to aim and imagine the best possible life that I can live. Right. And then you start making those choices, even though you're, you're, you're totally acknowledging the suffering. Right. And then all of a sudden you have the sense that you're, you're resilient and mm -hmm. that, you are, you, that you feel good about yourself in a sense, that you're not... You're not just being, you're not just being beaten down. Mm -hmm. um, so it has this kind of, this paradox happens, you know, uh, when you, when you make, when you admit that yeah. you're not being negative or being a Debbie Downer, you, uh, you're actually walking into the fire, you know, um, and you're becoming stronger. Right. Yeah. And from the actor's perspective, leaning into the pain can make you a much stronger storyteller because let's oh, yeah. be real. Like to be human is to be dramatized. It's suffering. H humanity yeah. is suffering. And that's the shared, one of the shared qualities that every human being on the planet will experience. And you'll be able to um, show that on screen better whenever you lean into it and you're not resisting it. Yeah. And yeah. you know, and as actors too, I, I, because I know we have, because we suffer in many unique ways in a yes, sense, we rejection, do. you know, rejection being a huge one. And, right. um, you know, and I often wonder if the monastic life, uh, my life now seems pretty monastic as a working actor. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just trying to be available. I'm trying to keep learning. I'm kind of obsessed over it. Mm -hmm. I love it, but it makes my life very simple. You right. Know? Um, so, uh, because even I think when you're a lead on a show, your life's real simple. Mm -hmm. Like you're learning lines and you're working all day. You right. Know? And, yes. But yeah, no. So I think that we, you know, as actors, have a have a unique um, perspective on this too, in a sense, you mm -hmm. know, because we we are constantly applying for jobs and getting rejected. Right. So as an actor, especially if you can really, if you really say the a light that everyone suffers and life is suffering, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a tendency, you know, our job is to is to walk in other people's shoes or maybe even, you know, kind of morph into other people in a sense. So that means if you really sit, believe that, then one of the antidotes for people of, of that level of um, empathy is service to mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Because... If you if you really believe that life is suffering and everyone around you is suffering in their own way, to help them or to serve them gives you kind of a no, noble, if not a holy purpose. Sure. Um, because you feel it, like you really believe that, right? And you okay. sense it, and and so when you go and help people and you do things for people, you're part of the solution in a way, right. or at least you're again you're certainly embracing the suffering because you're you've chosen to, to help. Definitely. Um, yeah. And that can become another source of a dopamine hit whenever you, absolutely. Oh, big time. Yeah. And that's a, that's a healthy way to channel your pain, um, is into 
other people and and helping other people thrive and and get through their particular everybody's pain's a little bit different but it's all similar it's the same at the at the end of the day um but it it can definitely become something where it makes you more of a selfless individual because you end up enjoying that you enjoy that position of service well i might add that's the other way to kind of get out that's part of the larger picture here which is since before you might have been aiming at the chocolate or the cocaine or whatever it was mm-hmm. that is the thing, you know, one's trying to pull back from when they realize it's not working. Mm-hmm. It's like you need to find something fulfilling to aim at to make all this damn suffering worthwhile. Right. Because you're not going to get out of the suffering. So and you're going to confront it to try to make it less less owning over you kind sure. of face it sure. in order to weaken it sort of lay ideas, maybe what you embrace, you can start to erase. Yeah. And then in the meantime, then you got to find something new and meaningful to aim at. Right. Um, which is where religion often helps provide people with something idyllic to aim at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, definitely. the idea of truth, beauty, and goodness, maybe. Yeah. Are not yeah. bad things to try to make. Yeah. Or, sir, or service, even if people... You know, if people have a real had a real negative experience with um, their tradition, whether it's Christianity in the West or, you know, some people have do not have positive emotion attached to their their upbringings. And of right. course, you know, that is, a, I think, a tragedy. And, you know, and yeah. the but you people can be honest about that and look at it and look at the individuals that were involved in that. And For was sure. it the individuals or was it the was it the tradition, you know, or is there a way that you can maybe make the tradition better in a sense, you know, the Catholic Catholics struggle with that all the time because we have a, an enormous human institution that's run by humans that are flawed and and corrupt in many ways. And so, you know, Catholics are constantly trying to revitalize and be the best version of themselves that they can be uh, in lieu of the fact that maybe the institution of people that are running the institution, you know, let them down. Hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. you're the, that, so you don't even escape the suffering. <laughs> entering no. into it. It's like so you're constantly in it and that, you know, it, it becomes this kind of radical self work. And, you know, and I I do believe, especially for actors and so like service becomes such a great antidote because, you know, even if you're struggling spiritually or with tradition, you can serve other people and you're 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 doing it. Yes. You're doing it like that's yes. you're going to you're going to do it and you're going to attach positive emotion to that service. And, um, right. you know, many in my tradition, many of the saints were kind of, you know, tortured by self-doubt and institutional corruption and all sorts of things. And uh, Mother Teresa being a great example. And they just radically served people through the suffering. Yeah. No yeah. matter if it was political suffering or spiritual battles psychological battles, Mm -hmm. you know, they just focused on serving and that's how they became extraordinary. Yeah. It's kind of like the universal language of healing service. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really amazing and boy, people should really think long and hard about why it is so powerful. Right. You know, because it, um, it is. Well, it forces you to step outside of yourself, and I think we spend so much time focused on what we want, what we're trying to achieve. It causes this um, bit of neuroses where um, we just are, are chasing, again, the dopamine hit of success yep. or the dopamine hit of like being well-liked or whatever. And so whenever you take yourself off of the table and you make it about someone else, all of that goes away and in my experience, there is a, a sensation of peace that happens whenever I'm not the focus of all of my energy. And it makes me feel less broken. It makes me feel less complicated. And it, it makes me more interested in, um, in, in learning more about other people's journeys and how they got to where they were. And it also makes me feel less alone. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, and we ha- we and we often, you know, I think as actors and performers, we have to be careful of narcissism. Yeah, we have to be careful that we weren't even uh, attracted to the business, right? Um, because of some narcissism, and so I mean, that's really is something people have to, you know, be cautious of, right? 
uh, it's okay. I mean, you know, maybe what drives us is attention and that mm-hmm. maybe is helpful to some degree in our business. Mm-hmm. But I do think you can balance it well if you make an effort to do what you suggested is to get outside of yourself. I also think it makes you a far better actor. I agree. Time. Yes, yeah. I completely agree with that. Um we live in a world now that's inundated with people that are begging for attention mm-hmm. and that's evidenced through social media. And that's something that Dave, you and I talked about at dinner was that, you know, it's like this impedes on relationships a lot. It makes it makes it very problematic because, again, it's like if your attention is pulled to all these different objects of affection, so to speak, or anything mm-hmm. that is like that appealing candied apple instead of looking at the the tree that you're mm-hmm. growing, um, it gets complicated and it causes problems within relationships. Maybe I just want your thoughts on it, both Jonathan and Dave, on, on how to navigate a world that is inundated with mm-hmm. look at me, look at me, and forming healthy bond with the person that you are in relationship with, if that's what your pursuit is. Because I know there's plenty of people who are not pursuing relationships and they just want encounters or situationships. And, but that's, that's not the case for a number of people. Um, so how do, how do people navigate that cesspool, so to speak? The first thing I thought of when you said that is, you know, it gets back to hedonism. And I heard someone say recently, I'll try to clean it up as best I can. The the rough way they tried to say it was sex with new people gets old after a while. Right. And that's part of the dopamine problem. And it is, you know, there is, there is a statistic of the group that is the saddest group, the most unhappy group. And it's, um, women age 25 to 35 who are single mm. who make around 70,000 a year I think it's that income bracket too okay it's that particular group and then there's this other weird thing which is you have um the dynamics between men and women are different yes. and women are sort of cursed with choosiness mhm because <laughs> mm-hmm. they're the choosers. <laughs> right. And as Darwin said, the female chooses and the male competes. Mm, interesting. And uh, that's the way it works when the woman is the chooser. Okay. So, um, and that's kind of how it is that that means women have that problem because they're kind of built to be looking and comparing, mm-hmm. which is a dopamine rush in itself. Mm hmm. But women are much more particular in that choice. Yes. So women have a problem because they only, on dating apps, they only like about 5% of men they swipe right on. Right. Yep. Um, Whereas men swipe right on about 50% or 40% of women. Yeah. Yeah. You know, every time when I've been on dating apps, every time I swipe right on a guy, I I look at his profile and I'm like, oh, he's probably got like 20 girls in his DMs right now. And I'm just another number. And it makes me so discouraged because Mm. before I even start a conversation with him, I'm automatically like, I already know that there's so many other girls that are like looking at this dude and that he's having conversations with. And it makes me very uncomfortable. And so I got off the dating apps because I was like, I can't even like dance in this, this arena anymore. It's not for me. Yeah, that's the problem. If you, what's, what's more complicated is the 5% of men that women swipe right on. Mm -hmm. They're all the same men. Yeah, exactly. So automatically means that yes, those men are the ones that have uh, as many options as an average looking woman. Right. Is what the math turns out to be. So right. a woman who is very average looking has as many options as the top, the guy with the most. Wow. The top 1%. So there's a little different dynamic there on how this plays out. And I wanted to, I'm, I guess I want to keep it a little around dopamine. Mm-hmm, um, definitely. Yeah. But when, it, but there's obviously a little more impacting relationships, but fundamentally your, it's, how big of a thing you're aiming for, as Dave mentioned earlier, is how big the dopamine reward is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're able to aim at 
like sex that's more intimate and more familiar and more satisfying for each partner Mm -hmm. after you practice it for longer, so Mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. And, but it's not just about the sex, right? It's about everything. Like you can develop a reward with one person that you can't get from an acquaintance for a month. Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, part of this is, is, is selection you know, um, it goes back to like, you know, uh, obviously too rigid of tradition is, is not good. Anything too, you know, rigid breaks and is frail. And so it's like, so what kind of guy, you know, if, if you say I'm a woman, like, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm, uh, I don't want to date, um, guys that are, are not serious or that are, are exercising all their options whenever they want you have to find a unique man that we talked about this at dinner, Lisa, Mm -hmm. that has attached himself to an external standard Yeah, by which he lives by a Mm -hmm. code that he takes seriously. And I don't, I don't know what the answer is outside of religion Mm -hmm. unless you could, there's, cause you know, you, you want to verify it and I'm not suggesting all men that are religious are good men either, but, um, you're, you know, I, I, again, I just, we're just, we're both, we're all trying to explore this. Like, well, what, what would that look like? Like a guy that's got an external, you know, high standard that he tries to live by integrity. I know Jonathan, our friend group, you know, we have a certain integrity, like nobody in our friend group, like is going to cheat on their wives or girlfriends and brag about it to the, like, that would be unacceptable in our friend group. Yeah. Like we're like, because number one, we know that they're not, they're, obviously not going to be, you know, the potential is they're not going to be a good friend right? if they're able to operate with and outside of their integrity like mm-hmm. that. So I, I think like you, how do you find this out about a guy without seeing external cues? Yeah. yeah. Like, do they, do they attend a, a men's group? Do they, can they have a articulate conversation about this stuff? Do they understand why it's important? Yeah. Right. Like, because if they don't hold themselves to an external standard and they're just all over the place and aimless, then it will be really hard to predict their behavior. For sure. And for women that are considering having children with these guys, yeah. you know, um, and believe me, I was probably one of those guys when I was, <laughs> I was 30 years <laughs> old. So I'm not ragging on dudes. <laughs> but, um, I'm just saying, I mean, I, I see the situation that we're all, I mean, I'm kind of in that now, but I can have these conversations with my partner and I, I tell her, I mean, I attend mass regularly and I tell her why I tell her I, I do it because I want to be a better man. Sure. I struggle with doctrines within the church. And I, I, re- you know, it's funny, Jonathan, and I were talking about the meaning of the word Israel. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the word means? No. We talked about this, right? I think we did, but I don't remember what it means. Well, it's funny because it means those who wrestle with God. Oh, yes. You did tell me that. Yes, 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 it's yes. It's not like those who like totally get it. Right. Those that are like <laughs> perfect, man. It's like, no, it's those that are like, what? Mm-hmm. No way, man. We're going to, we're fighting. Like mm-hmm. we're going to fight. You know, it's, so it's this grappling match and, um, and I, you know, uh, perhaps this can be done outside of traditions if men have a code or a certain, I know some stoic philosophers or there's some things out there, but I think like that would be the starting point would Mm be, you know, individuals, men and women, by the way, because I think it does go both. It It does does. go both ways. Absolutely. Oh my God. Well, and talk about dopamine. And this is interesting about your, like, I don't know if I was a woman and like a beautiful woman and I was getting DMS and likes and comments about my beauty. Uh, that's like crack, I would assume. It's annoying. And, it's actually annoying. Well, I don't, but what, well, what if it was taken away from you? Would you be annoyed or would you be, would you be sad? Whenever some guy slides into my DMs and he's like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's actually one of the reasons I advise men to never call a woman beautiful. <laughs> right, right, because it's the I thing. I say she's she's you're you're remarkable or cute or adorable. That might be. And cute is also cute's also body. one of those where it's on the line where it's like, yeah. it, I would rather be called beautiful than cute, and I get called <laughs> yeah. cute all the time, sure. like all the sure time, enough. and I get it. Like cute is that more approachable, whatever. And yes, mm-hmm. I'm very much the commercial, like approachable mm-hmm. girl, um, and my personality lends itself to that as well. But it's like it's not the adjective that I. I want to be yeah. you like I would rather someone be like, man, you're fierce. I'd be like, yeah, I'm fierce. Yeah. I'm a lion. Do you, think, 
Yeah, now that's interesting, and that's that's true. I don't know if fierce is a quality many men are attracted to. Though. No, definitely not, <laughs> which is another thing that's really interesting because there's that dynamic where there are women who are who are living their best lives, they're on their game, and they're functioning at a very high level, and they don't need necessarily to have a relationship to make their life better. And so the relationship then becomes a complement to their life. And, and those are the types of women that I know – myself included, because I live my life at a very high level, it's very difficult to find a partner who is in alignment, first of all, and secondly, not either intimidated or frustrated by the fact that you don't need them, <laughs> you know, like you want them. And it's, it's always a matter of like, I want you, I, I don't necessarily like need you to live my life. I, your, your assistance and your presence makes my life better. And I want it to make my life exponentially better, just as I want to make my partner's life exponentially better. But it is difficult to find a partner that can see beyond the facade. So like all the pretty girls on the internet guaranteed they are being told a hundred times a day, how beautiful that the random world thinks that they are. And it's just like, okay. I think, I think we also have to acknowledge that we are in very new times. Like this, this whole, you know, women not needing men, um, men having access to, you know, hundreds of thousands of naked women mm -hmm. on the internet. Uh, for free, men, not just you know, on pornography sites that they have to pay for and like have oh, a potential shame attached to it. Now it's just for free on it, on Instagram. <laughs> total. Yeah, we are in it. We are in the wild wet We We don't know what we're doing. Yeah. And we really have to acknowledge that. Yeah. And I don't know what the effect would be of a girl to be like, she gets her dopamine from, you know, thousands of men telling her how hot she is and sending her dick pics and stuff. Like, oh, that's so gross. Well, I'm just saying there, yeah. there's going to be a biological consequence for that. Right. If, totally. she, if she views that. And then how does she get into a relationship with a guy and and attach her, her positive emotion? And how does she switch that? If we've already agreed, there's always going to be a price. Right. There's going to have to be a transition away from kind of constant dopamine, positive emotion from anonymous men to like one man, mm -hmm. you know? And then of mm -hmm. course the man, a, a guy in a, you know, maybe a high status guy might have the same issue in a sense, but mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, these things are so new, these freaking problems. They are you know? new. They're very new. I, you know, I was in a relationship not too long ago where, um, where the Instagram thing was a problem and it was like, it was like the following and the DMS and it's like keeping, I always felt like he was keeping his coffers full, you know, just in case, just in case it didn't work out. And, mm -hmm. um, and that was, that was something that taught me something like I never pri prior to that relationship, I literally, never looked at anybody's Instagram that I was following. I wouldn't give a crap if they're like even commenting because we're in the entertainment industry. We're surrounded by beautiful mm -hmm. people, you know, like nine times out of 10, I'm dating an actor or a, a director or something like that because they're just our people and they understand our lives. And so I'm not going to think twice about them following a bunch of beautiful women until I got into that last relationship. And it was like, oh, oh, this is actually a problem now. I know. Well, look, I, I, it's so, you know, it's true. I, I, and I think that I, and I think again, we can take the, just like take all the bad, good words off the table. Mm -hmm. There is a biological consequence yes. to, a, to someone, whether it's male or female, right. uh, looking at images and liking them and carrying on conversations and commenting on shit. Like we just have to admit that there's a biological consequence. Totally. That yeah. You're finding positive emotion there. Right. And, and that will have some effect mm -hmm. on how deeply you're bonding with your person mm -hmm. if you've committed to a person. Mm -hmm. It just will. And Absolutely. I don't know exactly what that will be. Right. But something is yeah. going to happen. Yeah, you know? for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. Well, we, we've been going for a little while. So um, I'll give you guys both the opportunity to kind of sum this up. Like if you were to put this entire conversation into a really nice little package in a piece of advice, how would you um, approach the subject of, of dopamine and um, dating, sex, relationships, and life in general in a way to make your life better? 
Well, you threw in the relationship one at the end, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of it because we're talking about life as a whole, right? Like yeah. relationships, the, the people that you partner up with, they have some of the greatest impact on your life out of any anybody in your in your circle. It's like whoever yeah. is in your intimate space has more power over you and your decisions and the quality of your life than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah, I would say... Uh try to find really consistent, deep, meaningful relationships mm -hmm. and try to get your dopamine by aiming at creating goodness. Right. And, and I guess if I, I, I do think the most important thing is probably being honest mm -hmm. with yourself and with the people around you in order to create good. Mm. Um, which was just a little sub thing in the conversation, but it's what I think is the only thing I, I feel maybe I'd want to highlight the idea of aiming for being honest with yourself and others around you. Yeah. Dave, what are your thoughts? I, you know, for me, I would say, um, look at your relationships. If there's a lot of negative emotion in your relationship or there's, or there's a good amount of it, be very careful. That should be a huge red flag mm -hmm. that you are driving the train off the tracks. Right. Like that is, it, that cannot, that cannot happen. Mm -hmm. If you think you're going to be in a relationship and raise children and whatever, you know, if you want it to be serious and healthy and then you've got to monitor what's happening and how you're feeling about that person, because that will not go away and you will develop patterns of behavior. Um, around that, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, um, feeling. Mm -hmm. And so if it's negative, um, it's going to have an effect. You, you just can't tolerate it in the relationship. And right. the, the other thing, I mean, you, you've got to address it. What was what I'm saying. You have to, I think you both have to have this articulate what we're talking about. Like, Hey, we need to be, have positive emotion. I want what I want, you know, I, sexual fantasies. I want it to be about you. Yeah. I want, I want to like attach it to you mm -hmm. because I'm smart mm -hmm. and I'm wise and that's, and I want my pattern of behavior to always end at you when it comes to that, that sexual pleasure or intimacy, because otherwise it ruins relationships. Right. Yes. I think it's just like, just be smart about it. And the last thing I would say is, you know, for folks in Atlanta or whatever, we talk about the monastery there. There's yeah. a huge Trappist, Trappist monastery in Atlanta that's open to people of that's open to atheists. It's open to people of any tradition, and you can go spend a few days in silence and go listen to the monks chant. They have they're on a schedule, they're on a prayer schedule, and you can just check in with yourself yeah. in, in, a, in a space where individuals are trying to to aim at the the best thing they can. Yeah, you know they're trying to aim at whether it's you know the concept of God or beauty or truth. And they, and they have a certain um, structure and, and way of doing it, but it's certainly open to anyone of, of, of belief or no belief. So you can go there and wrestle with God. You can go and yes. wrestle with God or wrestle with, you know, yeah. Wrestle with the way it be. <laughs> wrestle with the way it be. <laughs> and I, you know, that's what I did and it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it alerted me uh, again to how many things had kind of infiltrated my life that were pulling me in different directions. Yeah. And then you go into a, sim a place as simple as that. And especially around individuals that are living a very simple life. And it does give you a unique perspective, you know? Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate this. I think this is such a, an interesting conversation and one that should be had. And it's, it's very helpful information for people who are looking to create more goodness in their lives. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for being a part of this episode of the In Session Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that you'll continue listening and like and subscribe and share it with all of your friends and leave a five-star review and also a written review. It helps so much as we try to grow the show. Again, thank you for being here and being a part of this journey. It is my privilege to be on this path with you, and I'm just so excited that you've taken the time to tune in. I'll see you next time.